the whole conversation about today is looking at a whole lot about religion, about tribe, about culture. The Yoruba tribe is one of the most urbanized tribes in Africa and are today found in every part of the world. Now, the history of the Yoruba people dates back to time immemorial and their existence predates their current political distributions. In the world, it's believed that there are 35 million Yoruba people and they all have their ancestry tracing back to the same place. That place is a town in Oshun State in southwest of Nigeria, the home and the beginning of the Yoruba people, Ileife, meaning home of love. Now, Oba Adeye Enito Ogunzi or Jaja II became the 51st Oni, that's the traditional ruler of Ileife and the custodian of the royal stool and a century of the Yoruba people in 2015. A gentleman whose reign has so far united warring forces of old, Oni Ogunzi has also worked hard to raise the perception of who an Oni is, youthfully driven, futuristic in projection, and a friend to all. Oni Ogunzi added a feather to his illustrious crown when he married a beautiful, delectable, industrious, and resourceful woman who is his queen today. Queen Ogunzi, the wife of the Oni of Ife. Today, we are excited that she is here and she's managed to combine her core Christian beliefs with the traditions of Ileife successfully so far and has reshaped and remodeled opinions about such coexistences. Now, through her N Herald ministry, she has changed lives and has preached the word, also serving as the president of the Women in Need of Guidance and Support Wings. She has so far proven to be a woman of high value for humans and one who greatly respects her culture and faith and is determined to make both work without clashing. Queen Shina Kuala has been a mother to many Yorubas through her position as a wife of the Oni and she is gracefully and graciously performing in her expected roles. On Villa Square Africa, we'll be talking to the wife of the Oni Queen, Shila Kuala, Naomi Ogunsi. Good to have you with us today. Yeah, it's an honor having you right here. Africa is watching and uh, we're excited having this conversation. You know, the thing here, let's uh, first start by looking at some of the key things people want to know. They would just like to say, okay, how did it all start? You know, when you first, you know, got, you know, for young girls who see you as role models, they really would want to know if it's the normal kind of, you know, Wound. It may it may look out of place, but mm -hmm. a lot of people really want to know a whole lot. How did it start? Was it easy for you to accept? How did your family also accept this with you? Because I see that you are someone who epitomizes a great family value for a lot of people. So take us through this journey. How did it begin for you? Um, well, for me, I was. I was busy with what I knew how to do best, which was ministry. And um, first it was the connection was what I was doing. And then uh, a king would always be a king. So um, it wasn't like the normal kind of, you know, you are beautiful and I think you are going to be this and that. It was, it came in as, um, well, I've prayed about this. And um, I would let you pray if mm -hmm. you want to. And um, oh, he, he actually gave you that time. He said, "Oh you yeah, can take your time, yes. pray about it." Yes, and take see. your time, pray about it. I'll let you pray. But I'm certain when you do pray to your God, mm. He's going to tell you the same thing that I'm telling you today. I care deeply about you, and um, having prayed about it, you would be best for me for the kingdom, and you know so. I prayed about it. I wouldn't have been able to do this without the support of my family um, because we are closely knitted together. We are very, very close and they all prayed with me and said, we are here. When you look back, we'll be here. Hmm. So, mm. And when you look back, uh, what's the feeling like? Oh, well, um, it's still, you know, it's not a feeling that you get over like very quickly. Mm. It's amazing. I was quite young. 
I would expect that older people would have, you know, been asked to come and take up this role because it's, it's beyond just being married to a man. Mm. You know, it's like one man in a million men and um, the fact that he holds a highly revered position. So that, that means that I would never forget that night when he said those words to me. I would never. And, you know, uh, you said something about your family, and it's something that a lot of Africans talk about. Just recently, we had a conversation with people, you know, in the Zulu Kingdom of South Africa, where women have a very prominent role to play. But somehow, uh, in, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you seem to be one in many queens uh, who's been out there you know, reaching out to fellow women and children. But quickly, uh, we'd like to see how it all started. I, I, I know full well you have a ministry, yeah. uh, you're a prophetess, uh, and of course uh, you're very strong in your Christian faith. But reaching out to women, has it always been a part of you, or did it start when you got into the palace? Uh, well, it's actually always been a part of me, and um, that was one of the compatibilities that my husband saw in me. Uh, the king felt well. She's always been for the people. She's always served the people. I started serving as a teenager, began ministry very early, and I've been relating with women and children, including men, actually. So uh, for me, coming now to become a queen meant that, oh, there is a wider platform. And another thing I would say is usually when you're already, um, when you're already on the path, do not marry when you haven't find, found your calling. Do not get married when you haven't... Don't, don't take a position if you do not have a purpose. Purpose comes first before answering the calling. So I had a purpose. I, I knew what I wanted to do, what I wanted out of life. I knew my life was supposed to be in service to the people. So when it came to me, it wasn't something that uh, uh, anything could stop. So instead of the environment actually limiting me and holding me down, it was more of an opportunity to reach a wider audience for me. Yeah. So, so how do you know? You know, some African, you know, girl, child or woman is out there watching and she's wondering, how did the queen know that it was time for her to leave, her, you know, her purpose, to leave her life uh, or vision? So... At what point do you have this feeling that this is it? You know, the hand of God was actually very mighty on me. And um, I was different from my peers. Uh, I think I, I started doing things differently from when I was in primary school. I was very different. And um, you wouldn't find me playing with sand or, mm. you know, playing with other kids. I was always doing something, you know, very matured, either asking to pray or studying. I, I, was, I was always reading. That was my hobby growing up. I would read, 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 read. So those things actually informed because I had times of meditations. And those things, I remember telling my mom um, some years back that, Mommy, I think this year, very, very soon, I'm going to start up my calling. You, you know, actually said that yes, to your mom? Yes, I actually said that to her. And she just looked at me. What's she saying? <laughs> but it happened that year. It happened that year that I officially launched out at the end of that year, towards the end of that year, around October, in that year, 2011, 10 years ago now. You know, Africa, we, we don't have too many prophets, especially uh, amongst women. Uh, quite sadly, uh, Nigeria lost uh, one, and Africa lost one of the most prominent, uh, you know, voices uh, uh, in, Christian, in Christianity, and uh, that's Pastor T.B. Joshua. Uh, amongst the prophets, uh, I don't know if there is uh, some kind of affinity, if there's a kind of relationship, if it's a man you met while he was alive, and if you want, w w would love to talk, talk about it. Um, okay, Prophet T.B. Joshua, I had never met him before he passed on. Um, sadly, I would have loved to. Um, he wasn't someone I'd met, but it's from my place, it's from Mundo State. And I've watched him on TV, he was a televangelist. And um, what drew me to him was because I was doing things that were strange to my environment, you know, um, brought up in a church where it's not so common. 
And then um, my parents saw strange things about me and the kind of things I was doing. So seeing him on television, I was drawn to him. So there is someone who actually does a little bit of, you know, or more, mm. something like what I do was the similarity that I found. And it was mysterious. I actually like mystery. So <laughs> I wanted to get to know him, know more about him. But I did not meet him till the past on. But my husband, you know, actually said, well, this is your field. You go represent me in this area. So it was, it was beautiful. I enjoyed being there. Okay, I was you glad. were there at his funeral? Yes, at his funeral. Yeah. You know, people watching will be asking questions. Uh, we're Africans, and we've always been meant to believe that uh, uh, our African traditional religion uh, is inferior uh, to other religions like Islam, like Christianity. And uh, for a Christian watching you, I know some, something is right there in his or her head, a prophetess, a Christian a queen in a traditional setting. How do you cope and how does it work? Uh, well, I think in serving God, I, I do not think God wants you to lose yourself because God, God wants to deal with you in the way you best understand, in your own language. God is, um, God is universal and so he understands everyone. I believe that in Asia they actually serve God differently in their own way, in their own understanding. And you know, these days you hardly find even indigenous churches. And if you do go to indigenous churches, we, we, we think differently from all this new you know, wave of uh, ministry that has come into our continent, that has come into our country. Um, people need to understand that culture is beautiful and God loves it. He doesn't want you to take everything that is actually you away because you are beautiful because god created you in his image in his likeness if we drum culturally in serving god god loves drums god drums we drum in christianity we drum in christendom if you are going to serve god the whites came in and told us about christianity we knew nothing about it our forefathers that we had forefathers who went to heaven we had forefathers who had a relationship with God, and they never met Christianity. He didn't come to them at that time. So how were they serving God? There has to be a way you communicate with God. I think a lot of Christian leaders has actually taken away that part where they allow people to find God themselves and relate with God in a way that they best understand and enjoy. So I enjoy serving God irrespective of culture actually connects me more to God. Because this is me. This is how I love watch, worshipping God. A lot of times when I'm ministering, I, I worship God in my native language. And I feel like I understand it better. If I'm singing, oh, oh, Almighty God, that is your name, it's a bit different from when I say, Olodumare, because I understand the meaning of Olodumare. And it's deeper. And it's deeper. So I connect more with it. You see, watching you, I, I, I recall once... I actually heard you say, you know, you were trying to give the analogy. You were painting the story of Moses. Yes, uh, perhaps yes. maybe my, 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 my viewers will love you to repeat that. And you said when God was going to reveal himself yes, to Moses, to he Moses. used what Moses did. Yes, uh, uh, you yes. know, Moses was an Israelite who was adopted by Egyptians. And in Egypt, what they actually do mainly is magic. That's their craft. And they had a school of magic, the best around the world at that time. They were highly sophisticated. And what they were training Moses with was magic. So what he understood was magic. And when God was going to meet Moses, every man must have an encounter. And that's the every point. Man. Yeah, every man must have an encounter with God. And that's the point where you can actually say, I'm a child of God. Don't say you started being a Christian. Don't say you started going to church. That's not the encounter. The encounter is that meeting place with God one-on-one. -on -one. That was what Moses had. Moses had just committed murder in Egypt. He was a wanted man. He ran away because of his crimes. He was, he was, he was a criminal, a murderer. And God was looking for him. God was going after him until he got to a safe place and a quiet place. And when God was going to introduce himself as the God of his fathers, the God of Israel... God introduced himself in a way because he wasn't brought up in the ways of the Israelites. He was brought up in the way of the Egyptians. So he was in the burning bush. 
That looked like magic. That was mm -hmm. more like magic. Wait, I've never seen a pastor say, God spoke to me in the burning bush. Altars don't burn physically. So that's more like magic. That's not one way that the Israelites were used to. And so he was surprised. Oh, wait a minute. My magic still works. That was what he felt. And, the, and, and God spoke to him and said, wait, I am the I am that I am. It's a new face now. It's superior. There's something different. And I want you to feel this. I am the God of your fathers. So it was even traditional. I hope people understand that he didn't just say, I am the I am that I am. I am the God of your fathers. I'm the God of Israel. So we would like to say it was an ancestral spirit speaking to him. Do you, do you get to have this conversation in the palace? <laughs> um, well, you know, um, uh, most of the time when we, are, um, when we have the privilege to have some quiet private time with my husband, this is more like the topic we talk about, you know, this is how we, this is how we unwind. I, I, I was told that, and I also read it, uh, so I think uh, Africa would love to hear from you if uh, there's any truth in this, that you, you had more like um, a revival or how do you say it in Christianity, like a revival um, at the palace? Within yes, the, yes, it was, it was um, and that's, that's a place called Afia World Garden. Um, I believe by history it was a place where... Um, the kindred spirit, ancestral spirit, um, mm -hmm. Odudua came down with the... Um, uh, Very symbolic. And one is actually chain. Chain, like yes. chain. So it came in from, into from that heaven. place. Yes. So it was, it was that square, it was that garden, it was that place I used for the crusade. And it was, it was well attended. It was, we had more than we envisaged. We had more than we prepared for. Everyone came around. There were chiefs there. Um, so, the, so king the traditional, the traditional chiefs, uh, they were there. Yes. Uh, Christians were there. Yes. A lot of people. A lot of people. Muslims were there. Everyone came. You know, you know, you know what you're doing. You, you gradually, you know, bring in what they call the principle of inclusion into the continent, and it is what the continent needs uh, at a point at this like time. this. Yes. Um, People bicker. Any moment from now, the Muslims will, around the world will be celebrating Eid festival. Uh, and time was when the, <coughs> the excuse me, the Christians will go visit the Muslims and vice versa. And it got to a point there was this gap, this gulf amongst us. But when you did that, because we read it, when you did that, everyone came together. Is this something you think you should? repeat or you should do again? Is there a plan that you, you, you want to do that again? Yes, I actually feel strongly that more of that, more of programs like that should come up and it's something KBC encourages to um, because if there's a lot of these programs, then all these um, differences and feeling more superior to the other person, you have to, one thing I'm trying to, to, to introduce here is respect respect if you actually feel like what you have is more superior you can introduce yourself without terrorism hmm. you can introduce yourself without being terrific if you feel like you got something better than what i have you can introduce it to me and we can be friends so if we do not have to do it with war with uh, with fights and all of that because it's something that has happened before and it can happen again if we come together as one. Tell me, do you feel like your God is superior? If, if you look at the case of Moses and the Egyptians, when he got to the palace of the king, the king said, ah, what are you about to do? Like, what's so special about what you're doing? I've got magicians here. We taught you. We brought you up. But he had an higher grace and an higher calling. And so by the time he put down his own rod, the Bible said that the scriptures actually um, documented it and said that he swallowed all the other rods. Yeah, I love that part in the Bible. Yeah. So the king went, wait a minute. Looks like he's different from us. So he was allowed the freedom of his people because of the calling upon him and the oil on his head. But he did not come with war. He entered and greeted the king with respect. So we need to respect ourselves. We need to respect ourselves. And uh, b b before we go on the break, I I'd like to ask your biggest challenge so far 
uh, under your role, being the wife of the Orni or of Ife, what's that biggest challenge? Uh, what's that thing that worries you the most or that makes it so almost difficult for you to carry on with your role as a uh, wife uh, of one of the most revered kings uh, on the continent? Oh, well, I think it's two things. Um, first is being misunderstood, you know, basically because of where I'm coming from, you know, being a prophetess, this side does not understand why I should be accepted into the fold, you know, and this other side also think, oh, she's left us, she's no longer a part of us anymore. So there's that misunderstanding mm. and, you know, people don't actually know you. And the thinking that um, everyone who goes, uh, you know, into this kind of marriage is actually going into it for something, you know, basically. And then the second part is the expectation. And, um, you know, you get to, you, you receive more requests than the support that comes to the throne. I think traditional leaders and rulers need more support from individuals and from government. In the days of our fathers, people take gifts into the palace. But in these days, we will come into the palace to receive. We pray for more blessing. But we are asking that, you know, individuals, government, non-governmental organizations come to see that the rallying point for every nation, for everybody, is its leaders traditionally. Because they are more connected. We get to see the hardship of the people. We feel their pain. We feel their pulse. They are closer to us. And, you know, so. You know, uh, someone sent a message. <clears throat> when we, we sent out this uh, uh, program, you know, uh, promotion, messages started coming in. And one actually stood out. And he said uh, he's never seen a king and a queen that are so open, that... Um, he was a guest of uh, you, the palace, and you and your husband and others were with them till in the thick of the night. He was telling stories. He was admonishing them. That's part of the uh, you know comments we got. Yeah. And I read it and I said, wait a minute. You know, time was when you know kings don't open their doors to their subjects or people around them. And listening to you, that these people have access, especially those who are in dire need. And if you look at the constitution of many African countries, uh, they have grassroots government. Yes. And it's almost non-existent. Nigeria Definitely. inclusive. Yeah. So that's why we should be looking towards what these traditional rulers are doing for the people. Of course. Because when all else fail, we see the politicians, they always call on the traditional rulers, please talk to your people yeah. and help us, rein them in. It's also happening in South Africa at the moment. Yes. It's happening to a lot of places. Yes. So, so do you get that kind of, uh, do you get in that kind of mix? You know, uh, things are already going really bad, not as a result of the traditional, you know, institution, but as, a, you know, a, a fault of the larger society. Uh, how do you help children, especially who are out of school, who are having drug problem? Does this also bother the palace and yourself? Of course, it does bother the palace because we are right in the middle. We are right in the center of it. These people are connected to us in a lot of ways. I, I have a, lot, a number of um, kids ranging from those in primary schools to our institutions that I'm assisting with their school fees. And um, my husband also does a lot of that. You know, there are lots of kids on scholarships. And uh, so we, we feel these things more and we want to assist more because it's not, it's not um, there's, no, there's no gain in it than the peace it gives to us, that our people feel served. And we are duty bound. There's something that holds the traditional institution responsible. It's easier to house the king than you can ask any local government chairman. Yes, because we are accountable to the people. Talk about your NGO, which is something a lot of Africans will love to, you to talk about. Where do we start from? A lot of young girls. By the way, before we go into the NGO, um, on VSA here, we've had this um, week where we looked at female genital mutilation. Yeah. And it took us around the continent, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Ghana, 
uh, apologies, uh, Kenya, Ghana, uh, and uh, you know even South Africa. Perhaps it's something that I would love to ask if that is also a part of what you're into, trying to see that that practice uh, is abolished. Yes, um, I currently serve as an ambassador against female genital mutilation. Um, and that's because I can use my platform to um, reach out to grassroots, speak to the indigents properly, because, well, this is a face they recognize, they respect, they want to hear, you know, just from my body language, you know, a lot of changes can be, can be done. So, and that's why I'm an ambassador. I've gone to schools, you know, and we speak to uh, people in the rural areas and talk to them about. So, so how, how's, how's the reception been like when you speak, uh, you know, because truly if, if, uh, if the mothers can have an interface with you, it will sink, you know, more. Because now this is culture, it's more like, you know, the custodian of the culture telling you that this isn't about our culture. This is something that you shouldn't do to your girl child. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know, naturally the, the, the mothers are excited when they listen to me or when they see me or I speak to their kids and they go back home bearing news of, oh, the queen came to our school today and spoke to us about this and that. They call him, you know, who receive lovely calls, oh, God bless you, you know, and all that. So I think it's basically because some of them don't understand that they harm this dust to their girls. And so when you introduce them, when you let them see what harm this does to them and what good it can be if they let these girls grow up without being mutilated, uh, they appreciate it. And, and you know, we, we, the custodian of the culture is actually, it, it almost feels like you make the law. It almost feels like you, you, you are the center of everything. So once you say it's no longer like that, then it's no longer like that. So if you tell them this is not supposed to be so, then it's not going to be so. So the reception has been quite good, I'll say. Sometimes we meet with arguments, you know, we cannot say that those kind of things don't happen, but we always win them with love. Yeah, I'll come back to some other issue, but quickly here, you know, these young girls who are out of school, you know, you're blessed. I know you talk about your mother. By, by, by the way, um, uh, the queen came with the queen mother. Uh, so perhaps we can draw from your family, uh, you know, values. For every African out there, he or she would love to see his children, you know, go through education. And that yeah. is what you're doing for those people. Yes. So uh, perhaps there must be something that has actually also drawn you to helping these very young indigent Africans, yes, yes. you know, get educated. Yeah. Tell us how growing up your school life, uh, you know, with your parents, uh, how was it like? And if that also has influenced what you're doing at the moment for these very young ones? Um, yes, growing up, it has influenced me a lot. You know, well, uh, primary school was a little bit smooth. Um, secondary school, my mom wanted us to go to the best school. She didn't want us to go to a school that works with her budget. A school that goes with our financial state and condition. She just wanted the best for our kids. She wanted us to have the best of educations. And um, so the secondary school I went to, so I can understand what it means to actually support a woman. She was working in my school at that time. Um, uh, she was in charge of food. And so it wasn't much she was making from cooking and selling to the students in my school. So, and then she approached my proprietor, actually a Ghanaian. Oh. Yes. Well, um, by, by the way, we have a lot of people watching News Centra, you know, in Ghana, and they're watching at the moment. And it's quite good that you're talking about a Ghanaian. Yeah, you know, um, Adai Mesa was his name. Yeah, he was a fantastic man. So my mom walked up to him and said, I'd like my daughter to come to this school. But, you know, I can't afford it. And the man said, so what can you afford? My mom said, half of the school fees. Mm -hmm. And so I had a scholarship to pay just half of the school fees throughout my secondary school. Oh. I would never have been able to afford that kind of school, looking at our financial status, because it was for the average. You have to be comfortable to bring your kids to that school. It was a career academy. At that time, people know what I'm talking about. 
for those who can attest to this. So it, it, it was in Ondo State. Right? Yes, it was in Ondo State, along Airport Road, Ondo State, Akure Ondo State. So, and the man gave me this privilege to have the best of education. You know, sometimes when people listen to me now, they want to ask me, "Do you have a master's degree in this and that?" Because it was it was personally taking us English language, and it was fantastic. It was, and he allowed me through. Then my kids, sisters. Everybody went through that school, except for our firstborn. And we were six in number. Mm. So, and he gave us the same privilege. That's a superwoman. Yeah, at some point, in fact, he waived some bills, even though it was half of the payment. So I know how even to pay that little, how difficult it was, struggling, piecing things together. And then after that, when we were to enter the institution, because we just had two, two years ahead of us, so we're really close in class in age. We wrote exams at the same time. We we're like the six, I don't know what you call six, when you have six kids at once. So it was as if she had us at once. So, and um, she was going from door to door because what they were doing, my father was there, but it, was, it wasn't just enough. You know how mm -hmm. Africa is, you know how Nigeria can be sometimes. And that's, as well. why, and that's why I'm excited what you're doing because if everyone and all of us can key or plug into what you're doing now. We can ultimately educate the entire continent. Yes, I actually have um, a vision to, to make sure that, in fact, uh, growing up, I used to tell my mom, I want to have a school where kids come to without food, we we'll feed them morning till evening, no uniform, we we'll give them the uniform, no tuition. Tell me you still have that free. vision. I still have that vision. So books free, everything free. I just want them to have the same access to what the privileged ones have. Because among these underprivileged ones are the best of us. Unfortunately, the best of us are among them. So if we can't do something, then so that, that's, that's where the passion came from, to do what I am doing. You know, uh, there are a lot of stereotypes attached to your enviable position uh, and, you know, I know this can also affect, we're still looking at your childhood growing up. You know, for instance, uh, I, I belong to a WhatsApp group about my school. And I'll tell you, my high school is more closely knit than my college, my university. And I keep asking myself, how come we're still this close, you know, close when yeah. it's still far, further than the university? the university? So do you still have some of your friends you went to you know high school with secondary school yes, yes. because some will say now that she's a queen maybe when i say hello to her <laughs> well we are still very close um you know the way we were brought up was never to look down on anybody and to always be pleasant and kind uh, my mom would tell you your smile makes you a queen so for me uh i have some of them we uh, in this lagos i've been in the last um, two, three days, I've seen one of them who we were in school together. Our classmates in that year can bear me witness who uh, Simeon Akimbuluma is, who Deji Adeyeri is. There's a lot of them. Uh, there are some in overseas country. We still talk. We, we still awesome. talk very well. Yeah. I wasn't this person that kept friends, but I was kind to everybody. So I didn't have a particular. So this was our friend. Everybody was my friend. Yeah. So and Herald Ministry. Is that how to pronounce it? Because there's an E-N. Oh, how do I pronounce that? N Herald Ministry. <laughs> e N Herald Ministry. Okay, e N Herald Ministry. Herald Ministry. So tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, um, E N Herald Ministry is a ministry. The man they came to me because God said, I want you to heal the land. I think it still works together with my NGO. Uh, because in healing the land, when you heal the heart of men, the land will be cleansed. The land will be healed. And it's actually still working with my position as a queen because we deal with the land. We, we hold the land together. We hold the people together. So God said, I want you to deliver people. I want you to heal people. I want you to bring the message of light, hope, and salvation to them. And I started with a crusade according to the leading of the Lord. And ever since then, I haven't looked back. Yeah. So, uh, and um, you, you still, how do they say it? You still evangelize and you yes yes uh, i'm trying to look at uh prophethood and ifa 
you know, I try as much as possible to read about it if I look at divination, you know. And I said, well, as the queen, if there is, uh, you know, you know, traditionally Yorubas believe in a far for guidance, especially when they have an important decision to make. Uh, you're a prophetess. Um, how does this work with you in, in the thick of things? Uh, for instance, Nigeria uh, could be in a dire strait and we're trying to find a path to solution. Mm. So do we go the Ifa way or we come to the prophetess? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, depending on your understanding. Because if you go through a way and you do not understand where that way leads you to, then it's a very dangerous path to tread. So your understanding of the path you are treading, that you are treading is what is important. I still pray to God. I still do everything in the Christian way totally and completely. I was not brought up with it um, to, to understand what Ifa is. If there's anything I know about Ifa right now, to be the little bits I get to hear from uh, my husband and, you know, the people around and all of that. But what you do not understand, you do not go for. But I believe that Africans majorly understand this part of Ifa telling us this is the way to go. And I've seen instances um, during the Ifa festival that was held in Ileife just before COVID started breaking out. It was mentioned that it was going to happen, and it did happen. So if we were to go by that, we would have seen that it was as prophetic as when the prophetess would say by so-so-so time. In so -so. You see that the three wise men that came to uh, speak about Jesus Christ, the beginning of Christianity himself, they were not Christians. They were stargazers. And you would only find that with those who, who, who practice divination. And that and, is Ifa. And, and, and they were record, recorded in the Bible. They were recorded in the Bible. And that is Ifa. Any Bible scholar can argue this with me. And they prophesied. And they said, look. Yes. And they came uh, and a, actually a worshipped. The king is born. Yeah. So we're looking for the king. We're looking for the king. And they came and actually worshipped the little born king. And they brought him gifts. And they prepared him for his assignment on heart. Every one of his assignments. They brought him gold. They brought him frankincense. They brought him, they brought him the perfume that was going to prepare him for his death. You know, I, 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 I'm forced not to let out a chuckle. And I'm asking, I said, so does, is anyone going to tell us that the three wise men wouldn't make heaven? Of course, they were messengers of God. Because, were, because, because the Holy they, Spirit, they, they because like they were an messengers. angel stopped them when they were going back to Herod. They were going, going the wrong way. They were going the wrong way. So they had the Holy Spirit directing them. So uh, spirituality, we live in a world of mysteries. In a very deep world of mysteries. Because they were met on the way and they said, don't go back to that king because he, he is planning to kill the child. So go back this way. So they did what they were asked to do. And, and Mary, the Bible said that Mary sat down and she was thinking about the things they were doing, everything they said in her heart. So they were the first people. No prophet came to recognize Jesus. In fact, the prophets were asking if he was the one or not. Do you still do uh, like a Sunday, Sunday church service? Because I, I'm trying to think of myself sitting in a congregation and just listening to you because your preachings are practical, that an African can relate with. Yeah, um, you see, I, 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 I knew I didn't, you know, I couldn't be a pastor because I understand my calling was that of an evangelist and a prophetess. And I'm not sure that I had this pleasant, um, persevering, people say I have it, but I still don't think I measure up. So to what pastors have to endure in bringing together the congregation. So I'd rather sit under a pastor. So I've got pastors. So I'd rather go to church, listen to the pastor preach, end it, share the grace, and go back to my evangelism work. So all along, people thought that I had a church where I bring people mm. together on Sundays. No, I used to gather people for prayer meetings, but not on Sundays. Yeah. I, I, if there's any man I, I'd love to have a sit down with, uh, is the Orni. Uh, and it's because, just the way we have in this conversation, I've heard him speak and I've heard him talk passionately. Uh, 
even on national matters, yeah. even on how to make uh, you know the continent, not Nigeria, the continent, a better one. Yeah. And I keep wondering if sometimes you both have that kind of conversation, you know, uh, when things worry him, you know, we ordinary men. <laughs> we can actually talk to our wives and say, uh, oh God, what a day. Does he also do that? Yeah, of course. Of course he does that. Uh, um, and, but, you know, he's going to tell you 247, I don't get worried. Hmm. But then, um, uh, the state of the nation worries him. And the state of Africa worries him. He wants Africa to be great. And then he has worries about the fact that Hold the people. He just wants to make sure that the people are fine. So if there's anything that worries him, it's just about the people. What kind of a man is he? Meeting request. Tell us. Oh, my How husband. How would you describe him? Highly unpredictable. So most of the time, I shy away from describing him. Because when you say he is this, and then he comes up with something so fresh and so new. So in the last three years, I've seen different sides of him. But, but he's someone... One thing I can say without, without prejudice and without thinking twice about he is that he's, he's a go happy man. He likes to be happy. He likes a joyous presence. You can kill him with, a, 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 you know, you can kill him with a sorrowful atmosphere. Mm. He likes to be in the midst of people. He enjoys people. He likes to be in the midst of not just one person. So I would look at him as, you know, there's this cartoon that kids watch. There's this Shrek cartoon that had a lot of kids. And so it's this kind of friend that wants to be in the midst of people. He enjoys the people. He wants them to jump, be all over him, jump around him. The, the revert position does not allow him to, you know, have human contact that much. But he enjoys it. Because I, I think I, I ran into him once uh, about uh, two or three years ago, and I was almost being stopped. And he beckoned, and he told them, hey, come exactly. on, let's go. And exactly. they beckoned him, and we started talking, and he said, how have you been? And a long time, I haven't seen you on television. So, I, I, so that's why I'm asking. But quickly, let's close on this. And it has to do with Nigeria. We're not talking politics, but we're talking about a future for the country for the country. Uh, just recently, we've seen that the Nigerian basketball team, you know, winning laurels, doing never before seen, you know, things in the world of basketball. And we've seen so many other Africans in diaspora doing so many things. And hmm. that is why people are asking if Africa, now, I don't know if it's prophecy, just help me here if Africa truly is the continent that will actually be the next point of you know, call for a lot of people in the world the way we trip into Europe and America will there ever be a time that the world will look towards the continent of course there will be there will be um, you see it's changing the narrative is changing it used to be a really dark a place not to go to, but there's something about Africa. There's something about us. We have attracted people from all continents of the world. We are highly industrious. We are natural kings. There are no slaves amongst us. We are natural kings. There's so many. There's the deposit of God in Africa as a continent. There's the deposit of God in us. We are extremely intelligent people. And that's why you can see this high level of corruption among us actually you cannot steal without having something upstairs you know so <laughs> so i believe that god is going to do something beautiful and truly awesome with africa if the new ones because the the new ones would actually come up the old ones will give way for the new ones and it's happening really really soon so this is an opportunity to be saying to the old ones begin to pack because the new ones are coming a new nation is rising yeah. I already see that as a prophecy from you, and I'd like to take that from you. Many thanks for being such a nice thank company, uh, Queen. And thank you for gracing us uh, with your presence and with your uh, you know, family and everyone here in our studios yeah. today. Well, it's thank been a, a truly enjoyable discussion with the wife of the Orni of Ife, Queen, Shilakwala Naomi Okunsi.